Um, my name is uh, Hagen Den with Synergy Electrical Sales. We're manufacturer's representative. Um, not to keep going back to the Amazon elephant in the room, um, but uh, I had uh, observation and then finish it with a question. Um, there was a comment made yesterday and it was relative to manufacturers reps and it was kind of a, uh, you know, you know, we wish they would be more of an expert and have a little bit more line focus to have that expertise, um, which I couldn't agree more with. I think that the expertise is that layer of protection um, between us and the giant, right? Um, but uh, I also think that there's a lot of liabilities our customers don't want to take on. And if we are the expert, we'll take that on. And that does differentiate us. Do you find yourselves, instead of having 2.2 million SKUs uh, in, in a in a process of con vendor consolidation to ensure that your team is also becoming the expert. Ex you know, good question, and, th and this is something that I've been talking about actually for a few years. Um, you know, in, in 08, 09 time frame when, when we had the downturn in the economy, we found, <clears throat> especially on the manufacturer side, there was a lot of turnover. Um, and what happened then is it required us as distributors to become more self-sufficient. And, and I, I'm still a firm believer in that. Um, the more self-sufficient we are, uh, the more important we are to our customers. And, and I, this goes back to the comment that I made earlier. It's, it's not commoditizing ourselves. Um, so I think if we continue to evolve, continue to develop, um, that allows us to compete against Amazon supply. Um, and, and, and I'm just a firm believer in that. We, we have to continue to grow as a channel, uh, especially on the distributor side, and become that self-sufficient, that solution provider to our customers that makes us important to them and truly develop them. And, and in turn, that makes us more important to our, menu, to our supplier partners as well. The better that we can um, sell and support their products, the more important that we are to them in the channel. So, that's my thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I concur with that 100%. I mean, product training is one of the most important things we can do with our people. We need to differentiate ourselves from, from you know, the, the internet. And we, we can provide those services like Mo was saying before. And the, the best way we can do that is become educated in all these products and train our people in those things, uh, whether they be in lighting, like we have lighting showrooms and counter. Uh, and the more that, that our people can do, uh, and that's why, like a lot of you in this room, are getting your people trained on Epic and, and some of the things that the NAD offers uh, in terms of training. And, uh, but, and, but also, there's all sorts of resources available you know, online in terms of specific manufacturer training that you can do through web. So I think it's really critically important that we all continue to do that and, and train our people in those areas, and then we can continue to differentiate ourselves from, you know, from these, uh, you know, the big boxes, and including the big boxes, because you can walk into a Home Depot or something. I've, I've gone in there looking for some, not electrical products, obviously, but other products. And, you know, a lot of people are clueless there. They, they say they, 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 they tra have people trained there, but they don't, they don't know anything about the products or what to recommend or anything. So that's where we can differentiate ourselves, I think. One note I just wrote down, too. I think we need to take the time with the manufacturers. We all have the opportunity to sit down and have booth conference really great conversations between the distributor and the, and the manufacturer. I think it's time we sit down and we ask the manufacturers, what aren't the big boxes and Amazons doing that we could do better? We have to educate ourselves. We have to educate each other. And we, we need to dig in and drill in a little deeper so we can identify ways to make sure our, we can sustain ourselves. Uh, the question I had for how we talk about the teaching, we talk about training, we talk about the new generation in the next five to ten years that's going to be coming into this industry. How do we teach them, uh, I call the old ways of actually communicating to somebody face to face, not hiding behind emails, not hiding behind a fax, you know, that's almost obsolete now. H how do we get that still personal touch because now you, you go out to dinner with your, with your family, you look three tables over. And every kid's on an iPad, iPhone, and there's no conversation, anybody talking about anything anymore. And you go to job sites, and 
people are at our job sites and they don't even talk about working on their truck or changing brake pads or, hey, I went fishing last week and they're on Craigslist, they're on Facebook. How do we teach that, that old way of communicating because that's going to get lost. We're not going to be able to have dinners with people to actually communicate. <laughs> You know, we, in our business, we have uh, five different generations in the workforce. And uh, we had a consultant come in and talk about it because as we're hiring new people and the things that we think are important for benefits or, or, or the workplace, or, they basically told me that I'm not relevant. <laughs> <laughs> because what, what I think is, is appropriate communication and face-to-face -face is no longer relevant to the people now that are actually doing that. And our customers, I have, these, I have this old, I'm gonna just say age-wise sales force, and uh, I bought them all iPhones, smartphones, uh, a couple of years ago. And they go, why do I need a smartphone? I go, because your customers are communicating with email. Oh, not our customers. I mean, you go, really? And now, of course, they're texting orders, and our customer service department gets texts orders in. But, I think you have to shift. I, I think that different generations are going to do things differently, and that's okay. And you just have to understand um, what works. So when you walk into someone's office, you have to say, where are these people? And look around their office and say, who am I dealing with? And adapt to whatever yeah, works. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah, my, my big concern is uh, the, 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 that we're losing the personal touch. Um, my, I've got four kids, and um, uh, even and they're only you know eight years from the youngest to the oldest. And I noticed just when they were in high school that the two older ones were always talking on the phone, and then all of a sudden a shift happened, and the two younger ones were were emailing. And this is before the texting became popular. And and now uh, if I want to get a hold of any of my kids, I I can call them. They never pick up the phone. Okay, uh, they don't pick up the phone. You know, they let go to voicemail. You know, I'll leave messages for some of them. Sometimes they don't listen to the message. Uh, but if I text any of my kids, I get a response like Your that. Your customers are the same yeah. way. Your yeah. customers are the same right. way. So, so, I mean, I think, I think, I think, uh, I agree with Hutch that there's a shift and we have to learn to adjust. You know, uh, my generation has to learn to adjust to the younger generation. But also, I, my fear is that that you still have to be able to talk to people and you know one on one face to face and i'm afraid that all this texting and everything sometimes i think is a cop out sometimes i think it's you have a difficult thing to talk about you don't want to talk to somebody so you drop them an email or you, you shoot them a text it's kind of a cop out and my fear is that the younger people are not going to be able to deal with the conflict and deal with different problems that come up on a one to one basis if they don't have any training, they're going to be, you know, they're not going to have experience in it. So, and I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer in, in things like uh, uh, Dale Carnegie type training and that type of thing where you get out and you have to get up and talk and do things like that. And, and, and you, you learn some interpersonal, you know, skills and that type of thing. And I'm also a strong believer of these, these type of things. That's why I always try to get involved in different things. Uh, activities uh, in the association, in my community, so that I have an opportunity to sit down with other people that I don't know and learn to communicate with them and, and get a, get a kind of get, get a feedback of how I'm coming off with them and and where I'm making mistakes and adjust and everything. So, I, you know, I, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I, I think it, it is an issue that'll come up. And it, 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 you know, those are my suggestions. You know, Heath, my wife's a school teacher and she taught first grade for years and. As, and as I watched, <clears throat> excuse me, over those years, the technology that changed and how she educated her students, it's like, holy cow. You know, I, I, you could see it. These, the, I tell her, I said, Nikki, there's no way that your first graders today will ever be able to communicate verbally. <laughs> and <clears throat> and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not sure that there is a going back, you know? I think as leaders where we are now, um, we have to, understand what um, the, the generation that is here now and coming, in, coming into this industry, how they best communicate. And I think we have to have those sit down conversations and say, how can we find that balance? Because here's how I best communicate. So we go back to 
with the very first question earlier about a work-life balance, I think we also have to find a communication balance between, you know, the, like Mike Barker said earlier, the, the, the class of 49 and the class of 2040, you know, whatever. We've got to be able to find a balance that, that we can both agree upon. And, and it's, it's going to be work. What, what kind of advice would you guys have as, for, for everyone in this room, I'm a believer, perception's reality in business. And as you start working through your career, you begin to, to there, there's perceptions formed about you. What's your, your advice on how to break out of that? So you may look at some of your staff now in your position and you could probably run down, I think Hutch, you kind of talked about it, the ABC. You guys could probably run down your employees and tell the, the quick strength and weakness of who they are and where they could be. How does one, or your opinion, how does one break out of that? How do you, when you realize you may have that perception, you may think you're capable of it, but you, you gotta prove it because perception's reality. And you know, I just want another deal we do, it's really helpful to me is we do 360 degrees uh, reviews and they're quickie and there's four questions or three questions. And I give it to the people report to me and the people I report to. And it's just a real quickie, uh, what do you, uh, what's Hutch doing that's working? Uh, what do you, uh, what could Hutch stop doing uh, to, help, what, to help you? I think it's was, how, what could he stop doing to help you? <laughs> stop doing. And uh, what should he continue doing? And it's just a heads up. And I, you just get back and I have an outside person, you know, filtered so everyone's anonymous. You know, I learned something about myself I didn't know that I cut people off. And like when I'm talking to someone and I, I'm done and my, my brain shifts, I'm onto another problem. And so I just sort of, and they feel like I just kind of, where'd he go? And I go, oh, I don't want to leave. So that came out of that. And so ever since then, I really take a moment to make sure that I don't disengage too quickly. So, so now everyone in our business is asking to do this because they want feedback. People want to know where they are and how do they improve because um, that's part of the one minute manager too is if nobody's telling them, they don't know. But. I guess something I thought about when you're asking the question, Drew, is, is you know, people perceive you a, a certain way and if you want to break out of that, I think you ask for people's help along the way. There's no shame in asking for help. So if you feel you have some self-improvement to do, ask people to help you. And I think that will change perceptions of yourself and maybe what others think about you just kind of humbles a person. You know, I, I too did that 360 um, several years ago and I thought, man, oh man, what a jerk. Um, and you know, and I went and I went to um, to Nikki Baker, who is our does all of our professional development. I still have a development plan today. That you know, there are certain things that that I didn't like when I got those results. I said, man, I need to really work on it. And like Mo said, you know, I, I ask people for help. You know, here here's an area that I that I'm challenged with or a weakness in, and I can't fix it myself. And, and I look for that assistance to help, because I, I don't, I don't want it to be just a perception, I want it to be reality that I really have changed. You know, because perception can be masked, right? You can be one way, you know, eight to five, and be another way afterwards. I, I want it to be a true change, if that makes sense. I think the awareness of the behavior that you want to change is the most important thing in like the 360 degree, if you can find that out. Then as far as changing it, I think you just have to change it. I mean, I think you have to just realize, say, oh my gosh, this is a behavior I've been doing and, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have to work on this. And I think it's, you have to just start out the next day and change the behavior. And it's not gonna change the perception of the people around you right away, but eventually at a certain period of time, if you're persistent with it and you're working at it, then it'll gradually soften those people up and, and they'll say, yeah, well, he's not being such a hard whatever, or, or whatever the, whatever the b bad behavior was. So I, I think that's the best way to approach it.